In this unit, we're going to talk about uniform circular motion, or as I like to think of it, how to accelerate without really trying. When we get to work, you're going to think that's hilarious, okay? How to accelerate without really trying. Uniform circular motion is really in a special kind of acceleration. But first, let's just look at some uniform circular motion. Here's our big bowling ball pendulum, and it's hanging from the ceiling like a pendulum, but if we move it like this, it's essentially going in uniform circular motion in the xy plane, this plane, right? There it goes. So let's draw that motion and see what it looks like. I would just draw it, I would just draw a circle like this. There it is, and um, I'd say at some point, the ball, as though we're looking down, is right here, All right? So it's going around like this. So if I had to start drawing sort of the, uh, the values or the vectors on it, I'd say it has some velocity, and at that moment, it's going like that, All right? So let's now think a little bit about this motion. How would we describe it? Well, one, what does the circular part mean? It's going in a circular path. So surprise, surprise, uniform circular motion means it goes in a circle. But it's the uniform part that's really interesting that we want to talk about. What that means is it has a constant speed. All right. A constant speed. Does it have a constant velocity? No, because the velocity vector is changing direction. Constant speed not velocity, and the speed we'll just call v. And I won't put a vector symbol on it because it's not a vector. It's just the magnitude speed. Um, so what is interesting, though, is here the velocity vector looks like that. Here the velocity vector looks like this. So what we can conclude is that there's a change in velocity direction. And basically that counts for keeping score as acceleration. So in 1D kinematics and what we've done so far, acceleration always meant the magnitude of the velocity vector was increasing. But this is completely different. Here the magnitude is constant, that's why we call it a speed, but the direction is changing. Any change in acceleration, or I'm sorry, any change in velocity counts as an acceleration. So if it's changing direction, that also counts. So now we want to think, how can we characterize this acceleration? So it's a little tricky. One way is to go back to your definition of acceleration and say A, the vector, is delta V, the change in velocity over delta T. So we could say over delta t, it's v final minus v initial. Right? That's what it should be. That's what we talked about before. So what we can do right now is pick two times and label them v final and v initial and just see if we can figure it out. So here's the center. Let's look at it here when it was going like that and here when it was going, let me draw it a little more precisely, like that. And we'll call this v initial and we'll call this v final. All right. So the vectors should be the same length. They're just going a little bit of a different uh, direction. And uh, to do that, then, we just have to literally do this vector sum. We have to say, let's draw the vectors now sort of independent of the circle. So we want to do VF minus VI. So I'm going to draw VF like that. There's the VF vector. And then I'm going to add head to tail the negative of the VI vector. That's how you would subtract VI. So VI is pretty much flat but we're going to change its direction kind of this way, like that. And therefore, Vf minus Vi, if you divide it by a constant, makes the acceleration. So this has the direction of the acceleration vector right there. So if you look, you see the acceleration in this average time is like this. So the acceleration, when you're changing the velocity's direction in a circle, points in. Right? This is A. And for uniform circular motion, we give it a special name. It's called the centripetal acceleration. So centripetal, I believe, means center-seeking, right? So as this thing moves around, the acceleration is always pointing 
to the center of the circle. That's why it's called that. So the centripetal acceleration, it's usually A with a little C subscript, and it points to this points to the center of the circle. And also another way to think of it is that it is perpendicular to the path. That's another version of it we will talk about. Let's see, what else can I tell you about it? So let's now look at a little bit of motion here. Let me get the uh, thing going in a nice circle again. So here it is. Here's the ball going in a circle, pretty good circle. So now if we want to think which way is the centripetal acceleration, it's always pointing in, right? So here it is pointing towards me. Right now it's pointing to the right. Now it's pointing in. Now it's pointing left. The velocity is always pointing with the motion. The velocity is always along the path. The velocity this way when it comes by me centripetal acceleration that way when it goes by me. So now you know the direction of the centripetal acceleration. You also need to know the magnitude. I mean, if it's just a change in direction, does it have a value in meters per second squared? The answer is yes, it does. Even though it's not a change in the magnitude, just a change in the direction, it still has a value, and it's equal to this. A, C, the magnitude is the speed squared over the radius. If we give the circle a radius r, it's v squared over r. And you probably want to know where that comes from. And I'm just not going to tell you. It's too complicated and not worth it and weird and confusing. So just trust me, it's v squared over r. You really got to know. I mean, OK, here's how you can get it. It's very complicated. It's very unsatisfying. But uh, let me show you how we can do it. So let's erase some of our definitions here. If you really got to know the magnitude, you can kind of think of it like this. I'm probably going to need a new drawing, but you asked for it. So let's imagine here we got our circular motion like that. And let's put it on a Cartesian coordinate system like this, where that's plus x and that's plus y, just because that's how my notes are. Okay, And I'm doing this, so I get to do it how I want. And let's pick a point in time like right here. There we go. So at this point in time, oh no, let's not pick that point in time. Let's pick maybe there, right? So there's the line to the center. There's the radius r, right? Um, what else have we got here? We could also describe this thing's uh, x and y position with this triangle. See, it's over this far in x and it's up this far in y. So there's a little right triangle. That's exciting. Um, we could also describe its velocity vector, which I chose to say is this way. That's the velocity along the path. And we could also get its x and y components of the velocity, like this. There's vx, and there is vy. I told you you didn't want to look at this. So you, you think you know better. Let's see, so this we'll call theta. right? This is theta, then this is theta, according to my seventh grade geometry teacher. And if that's theta, then this is theta, according to Mr. Reed, my seventh grade geometry teacher when we learned all the angle side angle stuff. OK, so now we have this whole setup. And you can kind of see there's a relationship between the angles and the x and y components of the position and the x and y components of the velocity. Right? They're related by doing a bunch of, of geometry. So what we could do now is we could do some similar triangles. right? So we could say something like the x component of the velocity is to the velocity as the uh, y component of the position is to the radius. What? Let's see, does that make sense? So the x component of the velocity is to the total velocity is the y is to the radius. See how those are similar? I should have done the other one first. The y component of the velocity is to the velocity as the x component is to the radius. You can see this one better because the theta is there. right? The y component is to this as the x component is to that. Right? Similar triangles uh, or the sine thetas are the same or something like that. So we could say that. All right, that's somewhat amusing, I guess. And then we could also say, uh, let's now write the velocity using those components. Okay? We could say that the velocity vector, therefore, is equal to, um, uh, let's see, the, uh, the velocity. Let's see, oh yeah, so we could say that uh, Vx component is v times y over r. The speed times y over r, i hat, plus the v 
y component is v times x over r j hat. And you say, wait a minute, the x component depends on y and y depends on x? Yes, because it's moving in a circle. This isn't some silly straight line motion. This is now complicated. Okay, so what is acceleration? Acceleration is the time derivative of this. So let's take the time derivative. The v is constant, constant uniform motion, constant speed. V is constant, r is constant, v over r. Pull those out. Take the derivative of y. What's the derivative of the y position? v y i hat plus v over r is constant. What's the derivative of the x position? v x x j hat. It almost looks like we're describing the vector, except look, v y is on the i hat and v x is on the j hat. What does that mean? That probably means that a and v, that the acceleration and the velocity vector are not in the same direction. Right, if these two things depend on each other. So let's not worry about the direction, we've already done the direction, but let's now get the magnitude of this. The magnitude of this a is the square root of this squared plus this squared, so the v over r comes out and the square root of vx squared plus v y squared, even though they're in the wrong place, is still v. Right? So the v from the vx and the vy multiplied by that v is v squared over r. And you say, hey, it's a centripetal acceleration, I'll put a c on it. See, I told you you didn't want to see that. <laughs>